100 years ago, the world was on the cusp of one of the deadliest conflicts in human history. The thought leaders of the time argued that war was almost impossible because of economic interdependence and the multitude of powerful European countries, all with treaties amongst themselves. Well, as we know, that's not how things turned out. Moreover, the seemingly well-thought-through treaties of 1918 may have led to the Second World War a little more than two decades later. Joining us now to detail the lessons we can learn from the First World War, in Washington, D.C., Margaret McMillan, author of The War That Ended Peace, The Road to 1914. She's also a professor at the University of Oxford. In Calgary, Alberta, John Ferris, professor of history at the University of Calgary. In Kingston, Ontario, Nicholas Gardner, professor of history at RMC, the Royal Military College of Canada. And in London, Ontario, via Skype, Jonathan Vance, historian at Western University. And it's great to have all four of you on the program to talk about things that happened such a long time ago. Uh, but I want to start here. And Margaret McMillan, let me go to you first. We're about seven, eight months away from the start of World War I 100 years ago. If we were having this conversation at that time, how apparent was it that the world was about to engage in one of the bloodiest conflicts ever? Oh, I don't think it was at all. I think people were saying, you know, we've had a series of crises. There's just been this spot of bother in the Balkans. There'd been two Balkan wars in 1912 and 1913. And we've got through them. And I think for a lot of Europeans, war just seemed impossible. It seemed improbable. It just wasn't something they did anymore. And I think they got used to the idea that they could have these crises from time to time, but they'd get through them. And so I would think in, in 1913, for most Europeans, the prospect of a major war was just unthinkable. John Ferris, let's go through some of the reasons, and we'll get everybody in on this as well. Give us another reason why people just thought that a war, even though it actually turned out to be seven or eight months away from now, a hundred years ago just wasn't in the cards. Well, partly it's because it wasn't in the cards. If you actually look at the way the First World War breaks out, it does occur to some degree by fluke. Indeed, there are lots and lots of tensions, there are divisions between the powers, but had not Serbian nationalist terrorists assassinated Franz Ferdinand, there's no reason to think that a war would have broken out in 1914 or that a First World War would have broken out in the next few years either. So in other words, what people are expecting to happen is a continuation of the norm. And as long as some kind of odd crisis doesn't happen, their expectations are right. Nicholas Gardner, was there also a sense that we're just far too civilized in Europe to engage in something as crass as a war? Was that in the air? To a certain extent, I suppose. Um, I'd say more important than that were transnational trends, like um, socialism, for example. Uh, which, like socialist parties do, encouraged workers of all countries to unite. And trends like that seem to go counter or run counter to tensions between nation states. So certainly, I mean, among certain groups, there was certainly a sense that um, we've forestalled war in previous crises. So I don't think it'll happen if there's another crisis this year. And Jonathan Vance, the notion that the Balkans, which had always been simmering but contained, suddenly was going to become far more urgent. Why, why was nobody kind of aware of the significance of that growing problem at the time? I think they, they could have been aware to a certain degree by reading the newspaper, but at that time there were, as Margaret said, there had been other crises that had, had led to nothing really involving the rest of the world. Uh, there were lots of other things in the paper that people wanted to read about. Uh, there was the early harvest, there was sports, there was uh, uh, murder mysteries, there was all sorts of other things that, that go on uh, on a daily basis. If you were to be diverted by every single crisis that came out of corners of Europe, uh, you would never get anything done. And people were busy in 1913 and 1914 uh, living their lives. Well, let's pick, bring up a map of Europe, if we can, from the time, because it was a complicated picture to show all of the different alliances that were in play. Um, you can't see this, but I'll describe it for you. The central powers, the German Empire, the Austria-Hungary Empire, Italy, are there shaded in red. The triple entente of the UK, France, and Russia are in green. And then in the grayish colors, there are the allies of Russia. And I guess we should say, as they did in World War II, Italy switched sides in 1915 in this war as well. Uh, Margaret McMillan, tell us, how, how much were Canadians paying attention to what was going on in Europe at this time? I don't think Canadians probably were. I mean, I think in those days, the Canadians, as other parts of the empire, tended to leave the management of foreign relations to Britain, 
they tended to assume, and this was, it was a, a, an assumption that was going to be, I think, shattered by the First World War, they tended to assume that Britain knew best and that it was uh, really up to Britain to deal with relationships with Europe. I mean, the, for, for Canada, the most important relationship, apart from the one with Britain, was with the United States, and that was one that Canadians took an intense interest. But for Canadians, as for Americans, Europe was a long way away across the Atlantic. And until the war actually broke out, I think Canadians didn't really pay much attention to what was going on there. And John Ferris, I guess we should remind those who don't know or who don't remember, the United States was on the sidelines for most of this war. Isn't that right? Well, in fact, the United States is a neutral and it's desperately trying to balance between the two blocks for the first few years of the war. And indeed, in 1916, what it tries to do unsuccessfully is to broker a negotiated peace between both sides. It's only dragged into the war when the United States is attacked by Germany. And had the Germans not, in effect, drove the United States into the war, my guess is in 1917, Germany would have won the war. Uh, Nicholas Gardner, before the actual assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, was there something that happened, say, from January to June, end of June is when that happened, 1914, where as you look back in hindsight, you could say, boy, that was a warning sign and the people of the day should have picked it up and they didn't. I don't think there was. Um, if you look even the early summer of 1914, leading into the, the, the month of June, just as the assassination is about to take place, a surprising number of European political leaders are not only on vacation, for whatever reason they're going fishing, um, but it, it certainly doesn't give the sense of, of uh, I guess, mounting tensions. And in, in the six months prior to, 19, or to June 1914, uh, I, certainly there isn't anything that stands out as a, as, as a red flag. Jonathan Vance, what if you go back a little further, maybe a year or two in advance of June 1914? Any red flags that today we recognize, but back then they ought to have seen but didn't? I, I agree. I don't think there really is anything that you can point to that, that should have been picked up on but was missed. I mean, at, at every stage that we identify, we as historians identify as a turning point, uh, you can say, well, um, if that country or this government had stepped back, uh, things would have been, been very difficult, different. So there's no, uh, there's no kind of smoking gun in this period uh, that, that we can look back on and say, well, they really should have been paying attention and, and maybe, maybe the, the road would have been uh, altered. Well, since you've used that expression, Margaret McMillan, let's talk about the smoking gun, which did go off on the 28th of June, 1914, when the Archduke Franz Ferdinand was killed by Gavrilo Princip, the, uh, the Serb terrorist, as he was then described. That's, in hindsight, I guess, the, what you historians look to as the spark that lit the fuse. We have seen, though, that in the past, assassinations of political leaders did not lead to world wars. Why did this one? I think what was different about this one was not the death so much of Franz Ferdinand. He was not that much mourned in Austria-Hungary where he'd not been popular. But that for the Austrian government, the government in Vienna, it was just simply one provocation too many. And I think what had been happening slowly, but I think really decisively before 1914, was that the key figures, the ruling circles in Austria-Hungary, had decided that Serbia was an existential threat to Austria-Hungary, that the mere existence of Serbia with the Serbs quite vociferously encouraging other fellow Slavs in Austria-Hungary to think of joining with Serbia, encouraging the Croats within Austria-Hungary, encouraging the Serbs, encouraging the Slovenes, was seen in Vienna as a threat to the very existence of Austria-Hungary. If the, if the Slavic peoples in the south began to move towards Serbia, began to want to get out of Austria-Hungary, the Poles would want to get out, the Czechs would probably want to get out, the Slovaks would probably want to get out. And so I think you'd reached a point in key ruling circles in Vienna by the summer of 1914 where people were saying, we have got to destroy Serbia before it destroys us. And so the assassination of the Archduke was the ideal excuse to do something about Serbia. So at that point, Nicholas Gardner, war becomes inevitable? I wouldn't say it becomes inevitable, but there are, I guess you could call them structural factors that, that, that click into place. Um, that are really important in understanding how the assassination of Franz Ferdinand explodes into a, a continental-wide war. Um, number one, you have an alliance system, which you've mentioned links all the major European powers, um, all the major continental powers plus Britain. And the nature of that alliance system leads to the creation of military plans that don't don't provide political leaders with a lot of leeway when there's a crisis. Um, if you think about it in contemporary terms, if a, if a state 
um, is considering the use of force to achieve a particular objective. Political leaders will, will ask military commanders for a range of options. Um, what's interesting about 1914 from our perspective is that military commanders are offering very limited options and in a very limited time frame. Um, so one of the things that's important to understand about 1914 is not only the existence of military plans um, in, in the armed forces of all the major powers, uh, which call for massive offensives against their neighbors, but also the fact that in the estimation of military commanders in this period, um, most of them conclude that they have a window of opportunity in which these offensives can be successful. And that window is closing. So the Germans, for example, would rather go to war against France and Russia, their enemies, in 1914 than, say, 1916. So that's one of the factors that, that, that pushes a crisis towards war. Um, the sense that if military action is going to be a viable option, um, it, it, it's better to unleash it now than unleash it two years down the road when there's another crisis. John Ferris, I saw you nodding your head when the notion of limited military action was suggested. So do I gather from that that very few people saw this thing exploding into something so much bigger? Well, if we, the key, the people who really thought about this most clearly are the German general staff. And the German general staff in the years before the war has concluded that the best thing they can hope to do is to try to knock France out if a major war occurs. But they're also not convinced they can succeed. So the purpose of the Schlieffen plan is twofold. To give you whatever chance there is to knock the French out of the war, or alternately, at least to leave you in the best position to fight a war that will last two or three years. And in fact, the German generals are never convinced that the Schlieffen plan will work, and they generally believe that a war of a two to three year long framework with a million German dead is quite possible. So in 1914, when the German general staff is pressing Germany to press Austria to escalate the crisis, what they're hoping is that if you press the crisis, the Austrians can take out Serbia and everything will be nice and easy. But they're also fully aware that if the Austrians don't take out Serbia, that you may be drifting into a two to three year long war with millions of dead. And John, I'm going to pretend I'm in your class right now and I don't know who Schlieffen is. So tell us, who is, who is the, well, the, the man this plan is named after? Well, Graf von Schlieffen is the most important figure in the German general staff in the late 1890s and the first part of the 1900s. And his argument is that if Germany has to fight a war against its enemies, who are seen to be Russia and France, it cannot win a long war unless it can ideally weaken or knock out one of the enemies. You can't hope to knock out Russia quickly. So therefore, under the Schlieffen plan, you fight a defensive war with as limited forces as you can get away with in the east while focusing everything to knock out France. And that also means you're going to invade Belgium and originally the Netherlands in order to knock out France fast. Okay. Jonathan Vance, uh, follow up on that if you would and tell us how you think nationalism influenced the scale of this war. Uh, well, I think nationalism is, is critical. I, I think um, what we see in mid-1914 is, is a series of cost-benefit analyses going on in European capitals. And, and most governments coming to the position that the costs of going to war are less than the costs of, of remaining at peace. And I think nationalism fuels that because no government, no society goes to war assuming it's going to, to lose. Uh, everyone goes to war assuming that they are the superior nation, the superior culture, the superior civilization. They must prevail. Uh, and so the fact that nationalism uh, in the two, three decades before the First World War is, is seems to be on the ascendant uh, with the increase of, in the press, the rise of literacy, uh, all of these factors which, which make people start thinking of themselves as, as members of a nation rather than members of a, of a local community. Uh, I think that makes the decision to go to war in the summer of 1914 that much easier because governments can delude themselves into believing, uh, perhaps, that, that the nation will be fully behind them and the nation believes it will win. Uh, Margaret Macmillan, obviously this was not called World War I when it happened at the time. They called it the Great War. Uh, in hindsight, we've called it that. Uh, but the, by calling it that, the suggestion, I guess, seems to be that the whole world was involved. Was that, in fact, the case? Well, it was a world war because 
Europe had empires, and so the empires automatically were at war as well. And Canada didn't declare war on its own, nor did Australia. Britain declared war, and they were automatically in the war. And hundreds of thousands, uh, millions of troops came from around the world to fight in Europe. So you had soldiers from Africa, soldiers from India, soldiers from, from Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Newfoundland, uh, all fighting in Europe, and you also had fighting around the world. There was fighting in the South Pacific, there was some fighting in China, there was certainly a lot of fighting in the Middle East, and fighting in Africa. It wasn't as widespread a war as it was going to be in the Second World War, but I think it's absolutely right to call it a world war. And yet the United States, uh, Nicholas Gardner, wasn't in it for the first three years of it. So uh, it wasn't in the entire world, obviously. There was no fighting in the, in the Western Hemisphere, right? No, not certainly not um, not directly, um, and certainly not to the certainly not to the extent that you see in the Second World War. Right. Um, the United States staying out. I, I think John has made this point earlier. In, in many ways, um, prolongs the war to a certain extent. Uh, now, it, whether it's realistic for the Americans to become involved in 1914 is doubtful. Um, mm -hmm. Among other things, there's there's a large. Um, German American population that, that probably identifies more with uh, the Kaiser's Germany than with Britain. Um, the United States and Britain as well are only well a century off of, of, of being adversaries or being enemies fighting a war like they did in 1812. Um, so yeah, the Americans um, at this point, we, we tend to look back in hindsight and, and, and think in terms of the special relationship, but in 1914 that relationship isn't particularly special yet. John Ferris, did the, did the rest of the world, in other words, outside of Europe, the main theater where this was taking place, did they have a good understanding at the time of just how appallingly brutal uh, this war turned out to be? Well, at the time, when the war started out, professional soldiers were aware that it was going to be extremely difficult to actually launch a successful attack against a well-prepared defense, but they believed it could be done primarily through mor moral factors or morale. Um, once the first few months of the war were over, in fact, professional soldiers and many politicians understood that an attack on the Western Front was going to be extremely costly. And in fact, you get people like David Lloyd George sitting down and saying that in effect, in January 1915, in effect, if we attack on the Western Front, we are going to be killing hundreds of thousands of men to acquire a couple of square miles. Um, people are aware to some degree of the casualties that are occurring because in the first few months of the war, first year of the war, people announce the casualties and journalists are able to provide some degree of honest reportage. But in fact, it's not really until the end of the war that it's clear to populations just how devastating and horrifying the Western Front has been. And that's for purely technical military factors. It's not because the generals are idiots. It's because given the material conditions which create military force at the time, it's actually very hard to break through a narrow, thickly defended area like the Western Front. You know, when the name of the former British Prime Minister David Lloyd George comes up, I have to go to Margaret Macmillan next because that was your great-grandfather. And uh, he turned out to be right about that, right? That hundreds of thousands of people were going to lose their lives to fight for 100 yards of muck and then lose it the next day. That was true, wasn't it? It was, and, and one of the appalling things about the First World War is, is that nobody seemed to be able to bring it to a stop. And I think if there's a book to be written, I mean, the goodness knows there are far too many books on the origins of the war, but if there's a book to be written, it's why it was so impossible to make peace once the war had started. I mean, there were occasional peace feelers or, or attempts from either side to reach out to the other side, and you had offers of mediation from people like Woodrow Wilson and the Pope. But I think the only explanation I can think of is that the war had been so costly and so dreadful that it became impossible for the political leaders to turn around and say to their publics, actually, this was a bit of a mistake and we're going to stop now and we're not going to win anything out of it. But it does seem to me extraordinary that the war went on. And one of the other mysteries, it seems to me, or one of the, the great puzzles, is how the peoples in that war endured it. But they did endure it. I mean, it wasn't until 1917 that you really began to get mutinies in the French army, for example, or the Russian army. Hmm. One of the things that uh, is also a great puzzle, and historians have debated this for, uh, I guess, about 75 years now, is whether how this war ended and the Treaty of Versailles, and Jonathan Vance, I'll go to you to start off this round, uh, whether or not that treaty was so imperfect that it inevitably led, uh, less than three decades later, to World War II. What's your view on that? 
Uh, oh, I, I think inevitably is a is a dangerous word. Uh, looking back at it, you can certainly see the seeds of the of the Second World War, and you can see how the treaty could be very easily manipulated uh, by the Nationalist Socialists to make it a a cause celebre, to use it to to unite the German people around uh, Adolf Hitler and the the insult that was done to Germany at Versailles. But looking forwards from 1919, I'm not sure how much of that. Uh, is actually apparent. It doesn't seem to be uh, demonstrably more punitive in certain ways than the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk that, that takes Russia out of the war. Uh, it's an imperfect treaty, yes, but is there such a thing as a perfect treaty? Uh, probably not, and, and certainly in the context of 1919, a perfect treaty was probably uh, not achievable. Well, Margaret, of course, you wrote the book, Paris 1919, which chronicled in, yeah. in wonderfully splendid detail uh, what took place at that peace conference. Could you tell us some of the tools that the Treaty of Versailles attempted to put in place that theoretically were designed to prevent another great war from happening? Well, and I agree so much with Jonathan. I'm not sure the conditions were ripe for a lasting peace after 1919. And I also think things happened in the 1920s and 30s, particularly the Great Depression, which, which played a very important part in the march towards war in 1939. At the Treaty of uh, the, the Peace Conference in Paris, where they signed these various treaties, I think what they were trying to do is keep Germany under control, and that was not easy because Germany remained the largest country in the center of Europe and uh, in some ways more powerful, at least strategically, than it had been before the war because it no longer had to worry about a common border with Russia. It, it no longer had to worry about Austria-Hungary. There were a whole series of small countries. So how to keep Germany under control was, was a big issue and, and not one they were able to deal with. What they also tried to do was build a League of Nations and build alternative ways of settling disputes in the world. And although we look at the League as a failure because the Second World War happened, I think it was a very important step forward in trying to build a true international order. And so I would argue the peace settlements made at the end of the First World War were not responsible for the Second World War in their entirety, that other things intervened as well, and there are many other factors but that some of what they did was good, not all by any means, but some of what they did was good in trying to build a different sort of world order. John Ferris, let me get you on this notion of whether or not World War II can be put at the doorstep of a failed Treaty of Versailles. What do you think? I'd, I would reject that notion strongly. First of all, I'd say that, in fact, Germany is treated more generously in 1919 than the loser of any other great war uh, between 1812 and 1945. The difficulty is that, in fact, Germany is treated so generously that at the end of the process, it's lost very little territory, very little population. It's almost as strong as it was. And its enemies have either been shattered, like Russia, or like France, badly crippled. So in fact, the Germans, like in 1918, are in a powerful position. The other dilemma is that, in fact, the three great victor powers, the Americans, the French, and the British, are unable to decide who among them is going to lead. And the dilemma is that they all gain from maintaining the order that's established after 1919, and they loosely cooperate in the 1920s during an age that I call armed liberalism. But they fall apart in the early 30s and will not cooperate. And in key ways, it's the inability of the liberal states to cooperate that is as responsible for the outbreak of the war as anything that happens with Germany or Eastern Europe. Well, none of you, Nicholas, are biting on this thesis that World War II began because the Treaty of Versailles was so terrible, and yet this myth or this assertion persists that it was because of this awful treaty at the end of World War I that we got World War II. Why does that persist? I think it persists because it, 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 it is a, it, it's a remarkably simple and neat explanation for, for an event that was actually more complex. Um, it, and I, I would actually agree with the others in, 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 in rejecting the notion that World War II stems directly from the Treaty of Versailles. If you look at Germany in the mid-1920s, this is a state that's making an effort and is succeeding at becoming part of the European community again, signing treaties with its neighbors. It's certainly not a, a revisionist power in the sense that it is later in the 1930s. Um, if anything, I think we might be focusing on the wrong question in, in, in sort of going back to the question of does World War II stem from the Treaty of Versailles. Um, I, I think if you look more broadly at the Paris Peace Conference um, at which the, the, the future of the Middle East is, is determined, um, you could lay a lot of current problems that, that still exist and have existed over the course of the 20th century in the Middle East um, at the feet of the Paris Peace Conference, in particular the way in which um, issues are resolved or are not resolved by Britain and France particularly in terms of who gets what in terms of territory. 
In our last 12-13 uh, minutes here, I'd like to really spend uh, a good chunk of that time then on uh, George Santayana's uh, ever-famous edict that those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. So let's find out what there is to be learned uh, nearly a hundred years later from the events that took place in the summer of 1914. Uh, Margaret McMillan, get us started here. What are the enduring lessons that you feel need to be learned from this great conflict? Well, I think there are lessons, but if I can start out by saying I've always thought that George Santanayana thing is absolute rubbish. Um, <laughs> I'm not quite sure what it means. It's one of those things that sounds great and everyone repeats and says, oh yes, how very profound. Anyway, I think there are never <laughs> clear lessons from history, and you can find any lessons you want in history. I mean, there are far too many lessons, and I, I, when people rummage through history, they can find lessons to justify doing whatever it is they want to do. But I do think history can offer some useful warnings, and it seems to me that what the summer of 1914 shows is partly the dangers of complacency, the fact that they had got through previous crises, that they didn't take it seriously till it was too late, I think there's also a failure of leadership, and this is something very difficult to avoid against, but I do think um, there was a real problem in the types of leadership you had in Europe in 1914. You had a Sir Edward Grey, the British Foreign Secretary, who just didn't take the situation seriously until it was much too late, and then came up with a series of rather sort of um, feeble attempts to try and get people to sit down and talk to each other. I think you had, in both Nicholas II and Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany, two leaders who were not strong enough to stand up to their own military, who were pressured into a war which I don't think either of them really in their hearts wanted. And I think we should remember the role of accident, that sometimes mm -hmm. ghastly events can come from very small causes. And an assassination in a small, obscure city in the, in the Balkans can set off a train of events if you don't get people willing to sit down and talk. And I think where we should be looking now, if we want to try and avoid something like that happening again, is the present danger spots in the world. I think the Middle East remains a source of potential conflict because it tends to draw in outside powers. So does the South China Sea, where you get outside interests coming in and where you get nationalist passions being whipped up. And so I'm not sure I'm going to offer any very clear lessons, but goodness me, 1914 offers us lots of warnings. I'm getting letters from George Santayana's family already who are completely outraged at your dismissive comments about his most famous line. What are we going to do about this? Nothing. I okay. don't know. No, and everyone knows, everyone knows the line, so he's won anyway. So. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Uh, all right, let's not say then, uh, John Ferris, lessons from history. I like the way Margaret McMillan put that. Useful warnings. What useful warnings could we have learned 100 years ago that are still relevant for today? Okay, bearing in mind that lots of useful warnings contradict each other, three things that come to my mind are this. Um, one of the reasons why the Balkan crisis catches Europeans by surprise is they don't take the Balkans seriously. They regard Balkan leaders and peoples as being barbaric. They can't believe that the Balkans are actually going to have any influence on what occurs in Europe. And yet the fact is that with the assassination of Franz Ferdinand, um, Balkan states are actually able to make European states dance to their tune. And that can happen with small powers quite frequently. Um, second, circumstances when power is seen to be shifting significantly cause decision makers to behave in ways that are not necessarily normal. So in particular, in the summer, in, the, in 1914, it's clear that both the Austrians and the Germans believe they see, looming in the near future, a deterioration of their position. And this is actually quite true of Austria. The Germans are overstating the problem. But there's no question that, in fact, German leaders believe that the things are going to get worse soon and when the opportunity emerges in, this, in June, July of 1914 to do something about it, they decide that they're going to gamble on very high stakes indeed. The final thing, and it's one that is actually not contradicted by any other th many other things, crises happen frequently, and when they do, people's behavior changes. Mm. One, of, one of the dilemmas in crisis decision making is that you assume that everybody's going to go on behaving the way they do normally. In fact, the dilemma is that nobody, including you, are behaving normally. And yet, if you start taking precise, adventuristic uh, gambles, what, in effect, you're doing is starting a process you can't control. And the irony is that Kaiser Wilhelm, having been the person who, in fact, authorizes the Germans to take the action of offering a blank check to Austria-Hungary, also, toward the end of uh, July 1914, is the German decision maker desperately trying to stop a war from happening. Hmm. Uh, but at that stage, he's irrelevant. He's lost control of events. Nicholas, lessons learned. Um, 
in some ways it's, it's more appropriate rather than quoting George Santayana to quote Karl von Clausewitz. Um, one of the many things that Clausewitz said was that upon beginning a war, um, the leaders of a state need to think very carefully about the type of war on which they're embarking. And I think everybody has ideas about what war is going to look like in 1914. But I'm not sure that, that assumptions are questioned. Um, one of the reasons for that, and I, this I think is, is, is one lesson we can take um, from the beginning of the First World War, is that uh, it, it's important not to overestimate the extent to which your society has changed over time. Um, what I mean by this is that, that the early 20th century is a period that's seen immense technological change, immense social change, uh, changes in the role of women in Western societies or European societies in that period. And it's, it's contributed to the assumption that, that any war that occurs um, won't be a long one because societies, modern societies, simply won't put up with that sort of thing. Um, in the 21st century, we, we, we certainly think we live in a society of, of unprecedented change. Um, among other things, we have the internet and Twitter and, and various other things that make our lives easier or, or I guess, more interesting. Um, but again, I think it's, it's an important lesson to take from 1914 when it turns out that Europeans are, are willing to, to make huge sacrifices and, and prosecute a war against each other for years on end while sustaining immense casualties. Um, it turns out they haven't changed that much. Hmm. And in the 21st century, I think, too, I, I, I'm not saying that a war like this is, is likely to occur in the near future, uh, but it's Im important to keep in mind that, that, that human beings um, don't change that much in, in, in the, the, the broad sweep of history. Jonathan Vance, lessons learned as far as you're concerned? I think that the one lesson that comes out of it is the, the interconnectedness, interconnectedness of the world. We seem to see this as a modern creation, globalization, and, and, and the global village and all that. I think what we see in 19, 1914 is, is the fact that the, the world is tied into one system. Uh, we were talking about what the war was called earlier. And if you look in, in library catalogs from 1914, uh, librarians who, who do a good job of organizing our lives uh, call this the European War, uh, uh, first of all. But arguably, from the, from the very beginning, it was not a European war. It was, it was a world war. And I think you might make the case that the Balkan crises before that, the Moroccan crises, the, the Tripolitanian War, remained limited wars by luck more than good management. And so maybe what the First World War tells us is that there's really no such thing as a limited war. Uh, any conflict has the, the very real potential to escalate uh, into, a, into a world war much more quickly than, than governments can, can move to manage it. John Ferris, you did say a few moments ago that one of the problems of the day a hundred years ago that was that world leaders didn't take what took place in the Balkans seriously. And if we fast forward a hundred years to today, do you look at a globe and see a particular part of the map where world leaders are not taking potential trouble seriously, in which case history could repeat in, you know, I, I use that expression uh, advisedly, admittedly, but you know, where, where we could be in trouble. Okay, first of all, since 1914, that sort of thing has happened on occasion. The Cuban Missile Crisis uh, does follow the same pattern. Some of the Arab-Israeli wars did bring the major powers close to confrontation, although the existence of hydrogen bombs does a great deal to cushion that impact. But I would say, for example, if you want to look at an area where something similar is possible, what's occurring in the Pacific between China and its neighbors in the United States does have some parallels. Both the Chinese and the Russians are very self-righteous people. They both tend to believe that they can control crises, that they can escalate crises, that they're capable of delivering short, sharp blows that will deliver a specific message. Beyond that, the Chinese are pushing all of their neighbors around to an extraordinary degree on their maritime frontiers. So in fact, we are confronting circumstances which could escalate significantly. But the existence of hydrogen bombs has gone a long way toward making it much less rational hmm. for decision makers to consider a major war than was the case in 1914. Hmm. Margaret, we also saw 100 years ago that w when the king or the leader or the kaiser or the czar, whatever, decided that the country was going to war, you went. And I'm not sure we live in that kind of a world anymore today. Can, can you talk about how much you think today entire populations are prepared to blindly follow their leaders into battle? Well, I'm not sure 
that it would be that different today. I mean, I can think of countries where North Korea, for example, where populations would probably follow their leaders into battle. And to be fair to the Europeans of 1914, it wasn't that they all blindly went into war. I mean, what, what historians have done is, is dug much deeper into what people were thinking and feeling in 1914. And a lot of people were very pessimistic, rather glum, uh, not at all happy about the prospect of a war or going off to fight in that war. But there was a sense in which they felt they had no alternative and that they were being attacked. I mean, most European governments were able to persuade, whether rightly or wrongly, their own populations that they were under attack and it was necessary to defend themselves, their families, their hearths, their own civilization. And so I'm not so sure we, we would not, we, we, we're, we're capable of doing the same sort of thing today, I think, if we felt we were really under attack. I mean, you think of the reaction in the United States after September the 11th. I mean, there was tremendous feeling, at least for a time being, of solidarity, and all Americans are in this together. True, but that's an all-volunteer force that went to war for the United States, and you'd have to say that for probably, well, I don't want to put a percentage on it, because who knows, but for much of America, they were completely untouched by 9-11 and the events that happened thereafter, right? But I think, yes, I think you're right. But I think there was a sentiment at the time, which seems to me parallel at least, or similar to the sentiment you got in 1914, that we're under attack. And if it had been necessary, it would be been interesting to see if Americans would have gone to, sign, to, to, to enlist. I mean, they weren't asked to do so. But they were asked to do so in 1914, and large numbers of them did. Who knows? I mean, mm -hmm. I think it's very difficult to tell until the crisis is upon us how human beings are going to react. I think we often surprise ourselves. And I think we should never underestimate the force of emotion and sure irrational feeling in the ways in which we react. And that's why I do agree with, with John Ferris. I think the South China Sea is dangerous because you're getting nationalist passions getting involved there. The J Japanese are now becoming a lot more nationalist than they were, and the Chinese seem to be throwing their weight around in ways which helps to foster that nationalism on both sides. And so I, I think we should never underestimate what might happen if passions get aroused. Hmm. One, yes, go ahead, please. An interesting um, uh, example of that, there were, there were in the late 1930s uh, a fairly significant peace movement on uh, American university campuses. And in places like uh, uh, Berkeley, you had uh, 75, 80, 90 percent of the student body uh, signing pledges that they would not go to war even if the United States was invaded. Uh, under no circumstances would they go to war. Uh, Early 1942, after Pearl Harbor is invaded, uh, Berkeley is almost empty of male students because they've all enlisted. Uh, so it, it is very easy for the pacifist of one year to turn into the, the infantry officer of the next year. Indeed. Uh, one thing in our last few minutes here I can predict with absolute certainty is that the four of you are going to be discussing this a great deal over the next four years. And that is because we are seven months away from the shot that lit the fuse. We are eight months away from the beginning of World War II. We are, uh, I guess, 2017 will be the 100th anniversary of Vimy. Uh, then, of course, uh, November 11th, 2018 is going to be the 100th anniversary of uh, Armistice Day. This is a period of, of the world's history that you four have decided to deeply immerse yourselves in. It's in terms of our collective history, one of the most awful dark chapters possible. And I wonder whether, and, and go ahead, uh, Nicholas, start us off on this. Does this make you, given the millions of millions of people who died and the way they died, does it make you pessimistic about human nature? I don't think the First World War is, is unique as an event that makes you pessimistic about human nature, unfortunately. Um, and so I, I, I don't think First World War historians necessarily are you know, a particularly morose lot because of what they study. Um, it certainly can be a depressing topic, but I, I think it's also a, an extremely important topic for a lot of the reasons we've talked about, uh, but particularly for understanding or in terms of understanding um, why the contemporary world looks the way it is and understanding the origins of many of the tensions that, that still persist today. And John Ferris, let me assure you, I think you're all a bunch, you know, a very charming lot, let me put it that way. Nothing morose about all of you. But does it, given, given the amount of time you've spent looking at this period of human history, does it make you pessimistic about our nature? Well, I guess what I'd say about our nature is that it's capable of taking a huge number of different forms. It's fairly plastic. It is possible for human beings to be extraordinarily courageous, generous, brave, filled with self-sacrifice and creative. It's also possible for the same people to be extraordinarily monstrous. And looking at the tests, uh, 
which strike human beings and human societies, teaches us a great deal about what people are like. So from that point of view, I find looking at war interesting and I learn a great deal about it. On the other hand, I also have to say war is a terrible thing and anyone who imagines otherwise should have to experience it themselves. Jonathan Vance, it is not a great and glorious thing to die for your country? Um, uh, depending on who you ask. Uh, certainly a lot of the generation of 1914, even after 1918, would have, would have still believed it was a, a great and glorious thing to die for your country. Uh, I think what historians are trying to do is understand how they could continue to believe that after four years of, of uh, slaughter uh, at remarkable levels. And I think that, I mean, the, the challenge, any challenge for any historian is to see the world through the eyes of the people they're studying. Uh, what did the First World War look like to people who lived through it? Uh, and that's a, it's a difficult puzzle to crack. And I think in terms of my research, that's what, what really uh, keeps me guessing is trying to get inside the heads of, of the people who, who went through this, saw it all firsthand without knowing what was going to happen, without knowing the end of the story. Uh, and, and maybe in that way I can, I can come to a little better understanding of, of how the story turned out as it did. Margaret, let me give you the last word on human nature and whether you are more pessimistic given your area of expertise here. I don't think so. I think, yes, I mean, war itself brings out the best and the worst in people. And so I think Jonathan Vance is absolutely right. We have to try and understand why people were fighting. They thought they were fighting for something then. And I think one of the things we must avoid doing is assuming that they were all poor boobies who didn't know what they were doing, because I think that's very condescending of the present to look at the past like that. But yes, it is a dark period in human history, but it's also a very important period, and I think that's why we're all so fascinated by it. It, it sh casts a very long shadow over the 20th century, and I think it casts a long shadow well into the 21st century. And so, in a way, you can't understand recent history without really grappling with the First World War or with the Second World War. They are parts of our history. They're not aberrations, and I think what we're trying to do is understand them. Well, I love Paris 1919, and I just got the war that ended peace today, and I can't wait to devour it. Uh, thanks, everybody, for participating in our program tonight. John Ferris from the University of Calgary. Margaret McMillan from Oxford University. She's out of Washington tonight. Jonathan Vance from Western University via Skype in London, Ontario tonight. And Nicholas Gardner from RMC out of Kingston, Ontario tonight. Thanks so much, everybody. And I'm, I suspect we will be calling on you again sometime over the next four years as we count down to the centennial anniversary of World War I. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.